Hello and welcome to today's edition of Petcast. Hope you all are staying safe and healthy with your loved ones in this difficult time. Today is May 21, 2020. I am Rifat Manan. I'm in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and I'm remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal who is in Boston. Today we are excited to welcome Dr. Fabiola Medeiros who is an associate professor of pathology at Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. She is going to present the inaugural lecture of our GYN Pat lecture series. The title of the lecture today is Ovarian Mucinous Tumors Primary or Metastatic: A Practical Approach to Differential Diagnosis. As always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on Facebook and YouTube chat windows and Dr. Medeiros will answer them towards the end of the session. Thank you Dr. Medeiros for joining us today. Over to you now. Hello everyone and thanks for watching. Uh I work at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles. Uh I would like to thank the organizers Rifat and Emilio for the invitation. It is an honor to be presenting the first of a great GYN path lecture series we are organizing. Please do not miss Carlos session tomorrow on endometrial pathology. This session is aimed at providing you with the main features of ovarian mucinous tumors that can allow you to differentiate between primary and metastatic processes. Before anything, let's look at the numbers. Primary ovarian mucinous tumors account for 10 to 15% of all primary ovarian tumors, and of those, 80% are benign. Most of the others are borderline tumors. Tumors. Mucinous carcinomas primary in the ovary are rare and correspond to only 3 to 5% of all ovarian primary carcinomas. When you look at these numbers you may think great most are benign or borderline so that should not be too much of a problem. However, here is the problem. Most mucinous carcinomas involving the ovary are metastases as opposed to primary ovarian carcinomas. Tumors that commonly metastasize to the ovary including GI tract, appendix, pancreatic biliary, and uh, cervical are predominantly mucinous, what makes the distinction with primary ovarian mucinous tumors very challenging. This table compares features that are helpful in differentiating primary versus metastatic ovarian mucinous tumor. No single criterion allows for definitive differentiation. However, taking into consideration clinical, histological, and immunohistochemical features, it is possible to make this distinction in the majority of cases. Some experts claim it is possible in at least 85% of cases, and that has been ex my experience as well. These four items here in bold are the most reliable indicators, and we will be discussing them in detail uh, during this session. A traditional way of differentiating primary versus metastatic ovarian mucinous tumors that most people are familiar with is laterality and size. Practically all primary ovarian mucinous tumors are unilateral. Therefore, a bilateral ovarian mucinous tumor is pretty much surely metastatic. A unilateral tumor is likely primary, but not necessarily, as some metastatic tumors can be unilateral, particularly that we see with colorectal, endocervical, and lamen. Primary ovarian mucinous tumors are large, the great majority over 10 centimeters, independent of being benign, borderline, or malignant. As these numbers show, a cutoff of 12 or 13 centimeters may, may be even more reliable. How many times have you received this massive 20, 30 centimeters of very mucinous tumors for intraoperative consultation and worried if they could be primary or metastatic? Well, if a tumor that is grossly mucinous, it is very large, predominantly cystic, you can highly favor an ovarian primary. 
Most metastases are smaller, but this, uh, then this cutoff of 10 to 13 centimeters, but there are exceptions. That brings us to our first case. 34-year-old female presented to the ER with abdominal pain. A CT scan showed a 25 centimeter left adnexal multisubtated cystic mass. The op report showed uh, absence of extra ovarian involvement. A salpingo oophorectomy was performed and the specimen was sent for uh, frozen section examination. The growth specimen consisted of this very large cystic neoplasm. Here you can see the fallopian tube stretched over the surface. Uh, when we cut the tumor, there was so much mucinous material. And once the mucinous material was extracted, we had this multi-loculated tumor with pretty much thin walls uh, throughout. So now I'm gonna share with you the histologic appearance. This is a section, a permanent section. As you can see, this tumor is composed of this very large cystic spaces filled with mucin. And within those, we have this filiform papillae. So we almost have like a villous structure and filiform papillae that are branching out. And uh, we can see here uh, the epithelium shows some atypia, but not too much. We have goblet cells. This is the immunohistochemistry. CK7 and CK20 had a similar pattern, uh, mostly positive with some negative cells. CDX2 was patchy positive, but not very strong. Set B2 was negative. Pax8 negative and ER negative. So ask yourself, what would be your diagnosis in this case? Would you call it an adenocarcinoma? If so, extensive or infiltrative invasion of ovarian primary. Would you think this is a mucinous borderline tumor gastrointestinal type ovarian primary? Will that be a mucinous tumor in Eulerian type of ovarian primary? Or maybe you think you cannot make that differentiation with what you, what you have been presented in this case. So the diagnosis is a mucinous borderline tumor gastrointestinal type of ovarian primary. And everything I showed from the growth to the micro to the immunohistochemistry is absolutely characteristic of this tumor type. Mucinous borderline tumors gastrointestinal type primary in the ovary tend to have this very large mucinous cyst that have uh, inside this filiform papillae. In my experience, if the epithelium is predominantly intestinal, the filiform papillae are going to be very well developed, while if it's more like a gastric epithelium, the filiform papillae are a little bit more blunt. It's too well developed, but not as prominent as intestinal. This is the cytology. Here we have the intestinal type with uh, nice goblet cells and uh, the gastric type with foveolar type cells. So question, do you actually need to find goblet cells? And the answer is no. You do not need to find goblet cells to call a tumor gastrointestinal type in the ovary. And histochemical studies in the past have shown that the tumors can exhibit intestinal, gastric, and pancreatic atobiliary differentiation. So what are features that you can see then that are characteristic that you see in some cases of uh, mucinous borderline tumor primary in the ovary. Often you see tufting, which is this detached epithelium here, so the stratification. Uh, you see, you can see fusion of papillae. Uh, some people worry about this outpouching uh, and think this may be invasive, but notice that there are very, very smooth outlines. And this is basically the epithelium trying to recapitulate the gastrointestinal tract with the crypts. 
Uh, a lot of, I mean, it's a characteristic feature of mucinous tumors, primary in the ovary, to have this adenoma to borderline into carcinoma sometimes when it's present transition. Here we have a nice example of a mucinous cystadenoma type of epithelium transitioning to a borderline epithelium. So how, how much do you need to see to call a tumor borderline? At least 10% of the epithelium in all the sections you have examined should show borderline features. If you don't have enough, it's acceptable that you call it a mucinous adenoma with focal epithelial proliferation. Other findings, one that is very common is intractylial carcinoma. Here, uh, usually the cells are mucin depleted and show increased atypia. And very uncommonly, you don't see this very often, is microinvasion where you're going to see a, the, a, like a, fo a small focus with desmoplastic reaction and tumor, in tumor cells invading the stroma. That's kind of uncommon in mucinous borderline tumors. Either of those do not affect prognosis. It's important to look for them and to report them, but they do not affect prognosis. That brings us to challenge number one. This has happened a lot to me, and it probably has happened to you too. Have you ever caught yourself wondering if the chip and complexity were too much just for a borderline tumor? These tumors are very lush and very proliferative, so oftentimes we ask ourselves, is this enough for carcinoma? And it is often a challenge to decide how much of it is a borderline tumor and how much is a carcinoma. I wanted to share with you this nice example that has both components side by side. So here on the right, we have the borderline component in which we have those large mucinous filled cysts. When we transition to adenocarcinoma, the most characteristic feature that I find very helpful is obliteration of cystic spaces. So as you can see now, you have all epithelium here. Cystic spaces are pretty much gone. What causes the glands should be back to back with minimal or intervening, uh, with minimal or no intervening stroma. This is a higher power view here showing the very crowded glands. Usually, um, Mucinous adenocarcinomas of the ovary have low nuclear grade, low to moderate, let's say. Most of them display the adenoma borderline carcinoma sequence and have associated mucinous borderline tumor and intractylial carcinoma. So what I'm showing here is what we call the expensile confluent invasion, which is by far the most common type of invasion you're going to see in these tumors. There is another type that is called infiltrative destructive invasion. Honestly, that's very rare. Okay, if it's a predominant pattern in the ovary, honestly, it's metastatic until proven otherwise. Now, and it's important because it has a poor prognosis, while the expansile type has a very similar prognosis as just the mucinous borderline tumor. Now, I would like to touch upon uh, Miller and mucinous tumors because that's very strong evidence that a tumor is primary ovarian. Millerian type mucinous tumors are also known as seromucinous tumors or mucinous tumors in the cervical type. Actually, WHO calls them seromucinous tumors. This is a very interesting paper by Dr. Kerman in which he questions that nomenclature. And he proposes that we instead we use mixed Millerian tumors. And there are a few reasons for that. One of them is that actually these tumors are composed of a mixture of cells, ciliated, mucinous, hobnail, endometrioid. And here we apply the 10% rule, meaning you need at least two cell types composing at least 10% of the tumor volume to apply this type of diagnosis. These tumors are negative for WT1, and as you know, serous tumors are usually positive. That's another reason why we question, are they really serous tumors? Probably not. Another thing is genetics. The genetic mutations they show are more in keeping with endometrioid clear cell pathway and really have not much to do with the serous or mucinous pathway. These are uncommon tumors, uh, only 5% of all borderline ovarian tumors, and they're usually borderline. Adenoma and carcinoma are quite rare. The very important feature of these tumors is that they're usually bilateral. 
and 20% of them has extravariant spread. So this is a really a pitfall. Why? If you do not recognize a mucinous tumor in the ovary is Mullerian type, and it presents to you as a bilateral tumor, you may be tempted to call it metastatic. So it's very, very important to recognize this tumor in the ovary, even though it's uncommon. They are usually smaller than your intestinal type or your lung tumor. Uh, oftentimes you do see the stapillary projections. Sometimes you see an endometrioma in the background with areas of hemorrhage. Architecturally, they're very characteristic. Unlike the intestinal type borderline tumor that has those filiform, very, very narrow papillae, this tumor instead has this very broad papillae. It has hierarchical branching similar to what you see with serious borderline tumors. So remember, in borderline gastrointestinal tumor, you don't have hierarchical branching. You just have those filiform papillae coming out of the cyst wall. Here instead, we have hierarchical branching and we have this broad papillae. And these papillae are characteristically edematous. And uh, characteristically, these papillae contain neutrophils. I showed that better here. In the next picture, there are a lot of inflammatory cells. The mixture of cell types. Well, here you have the very characteristic endocervical type bland mucinous epithelium. And here you have some hobnail cells. You have some cells that look, kind of look undifferentiated. You can have ciliated cells, clear cells. It's really a mixture of cell types and that varies from case to case. Immunohistochemistry, immunohistochemistry for these tumors is very, very characteristic. You cannot miss it. If you do the usual panel of CK7, CK20, PEX8, and intestinal markers, you're gonna see that the tumors are positive for CK7, positive for PEX8, and completely negative for all intestinal markers, CK20, CDX2, and SATP2. That's in contrast with the primary ovarian borderline tumors of gastrointestinal type that almost invariably will show a little bit of CK20, a little bit of CDX2, and not such a great CK7. Now, if you really wanna know for sure this is what you're dealing with, you should do an ER. ER staining is very black and white in this situation because it's positive in malarian mucinous tumors of uh, malarian mucinous tumors and it's always, always negative in any gastrointestinal tumor, primary or metastatic to the ovary. So how do you recognize malaria mucinous tumors? Based on our architecture that we discussed, the mixture of cell types and the very characteristic immunohistochemical pattern. And why is it important to recognize them? The main reason why it's important is because if you have a malaria mucinous tumor in the ovary, metastases are not in the differential. So no exception. That brings us to the next case. This case is of a 20-year-old female who presented with abdominal discomfort. Pelvic ultrasound showed a nine centimeter complex adnexal cyst with internal echoes and a hyperechoic structure. This is a picture here from the laparoscopy showing the ovarian mass with the background uterus here. A cystectomy was performed and sent to permanence. So let me open this case. So here is the cystectomy specimen. And immediately you can tell it's mucinous, right? That's no problem. It's actually very mucinous. It has what we call a lot of dissection of mucin in the ovarian stroma that is called pseudomyxoma ovarii. And then uh, we do see our mucinous epithelium here, which actually looks kind of bland. And we have nice goblet cells. So this is the appearance here of this ovarian cystectomy for this patient. This is the immunohistochemical pattern. The strong glands physically positive for CK20, CDX2, and SATB2, negative for PAX8, and CK7 is mostly negative with only a few positive cells. So what would be your diagnosis in this case? Well, it's obviously a mucinous neoplasm. 
Now, what will be your primary site? Which primary site would you favor? Would you favor appendix, colorectal, pancreatobiliary, primary ovarian, or maybe you want to say to your surgeon that it could be either an appendiceal primary or an ovarian primary? And the answer is E. So if you have this pattern with extensive pseudomyxoma ovarii in the ovary and this immunohistochemical pattern of what we call a like complete enteric uh, immunophenotype, your differential is a lower GI tract, usually appendix and an ovarian primary. However, I would like to share with you another slide from this case. And here it is. So here is our mucinous tumor, and I think anyone would recognize this as a mature cystic teratoma component, right? We have sebaceous glands, we have eccrine glands, we have fat. So how does that change our diagnosis now? Now you can be sure it's a primary ovarian mucinous tumor because you know it's arising in association with mature cystic teratoma. So it's not an appendiceal metastasis in this case. Most of the time when you have a teratoma associated mucinous neoplasm, the teratoma component is grossly visible, but sometimes it's not going to be grossly visible, and that's why it's important to sample well. Extensive pseudomyxoma varia is present in the majority of cases. They can also have pseudomyxoma peritonei in up to 25% of cases, uh, and if that pseudomyxoma peritonei component is associated with carcinomatosis, then the prognosis is poor. Now, morphologically, these tumors arising with teratomas, they can display an adenoma morphology, a borderline morphology, or a carcinoma morphology. If it's obvious, let's say if it really looks so bland and benign, it's usually safe to call it adenoma, but I would, I would disencourage that because we don't know much about how these neoplasms behave. If it looks like a carcinoma, it's so bad, it's so infiltrative, it has higher grade nuclear features, you may call it a carcinoma. But oftentimes we just don't know what to call them because they don't really fall in that spectrum of primary ovarian tumors. So I, we usually call them mucinous neoplasms, primary in the ovary associated with a teratoma with a comment. This is a picture of pseudomyxoma varii. Uh, this is another example here of a case that has a more bland appearance in one area and a borderline appearance in another area. Another tumor that falls into the same ballpark is uh, mucinous tumors in the ovary associated with Brenner tumor. In this case, we have a simple cyst, which turned out to be a mucinous cyst adenoma, and within the wall, we found this kind of yellow solid area, and microscopically, we can see it's a Brenner tumor. We have this nest of transitional looking bland cells within a very fibrotic stroma. There are some differences between teratoma-related and Brenner tumor-related ovarian mucinous tumors, uh, as you can see here. However, the most important thing is that they are on ovarian primary. So rest assured, if you see a teratoma, if you see a Brenner tumor, that's an ovarian primary. Are there collision tumors, meaning can you have a teratoma and a metastatic appendiceal tumor to the ovary? Yes, there are case reports, but that's extremely rare. Right, so for, for general purpose, it's an ovarian primary. So almost no exception to this rule. Now let's talk about um, metastatic morphologies. What do I mean by that? When I talk about metastatic morphologies, I'm not only talking about micro, I'm also talking about the gross appearance. So if you get a mucinous tumor in the ovary that is solid and flesh like this, I can assure you it's not primary ovarian. This is a Krukenberg tumor with signet ring cells infiltrating the uh, ovarian cortex. This is an example of uh, metastatic carcinoma X goblet cell carcinoid from the appendix. 
uh, you can see the goblet cells and those would be positive for synaptophysin. Usually you have the appendix in those cases and it will be obvious the primary site. Another metastatic morphology, again, predominantly solid mucinous tumors in the ovary are usually metastatic. Okay, this is a very solid tumor with lots of necrosis. And this one is a much smaller tumor, but it's still very necrotic. This one is kind of deceiving. You may even think it's a fibroma. But both of them are metastatic colorectal carcinoma. And we are all very familiar of how that looks like. Dirty necrosis is a very uh, important finding uh, because they have pseudostratified nuclei and most often they're not super mucinous. Actually, endometrioid carcinoma primary in the ovary is more commonly in the differential than mucinous tumors for colorectal, but some of them can be very mucinous. Uh, this is segmental dirty necrosis, a finding that is characteristic in colorectal tumors. So if you have a predominantly signet ring cell carcinoma in the ovary, it is metastatic. Now, some primary ovarian mucinous carcinomas, predominantly the ones associated with teratomas, they can have some signet ring cells and that's okay. But if it's signet ring cells everywhere, that's a metastatic carcinoma. Now, we talked about metastatic morphologies, so what are the ovarian morphologies? That's when we fall into the challenge number two for ovarian mucinous tumors, because if a tumor is metastatic to the ovary and has an ovarian type of morphology, then it's hard. Then it's hard to differentiate if it's primary or metastatic. That brings us to our third case. This case is a 46-year-old female who presented with abdominal distension, constipation, and inability to tolerate foods and liquids. CT showed a 25-centimeter cystic abdominal mass involving the left ovary. Laparotomy showed a mucinous neoplasm that was involving bilateral ovary and appendix with peritoneal and mental deposits. This is the gross appearance on the left here. This is the status post intraoperative consultation. This tumor was filled with mucinous material. This is the smaller right side, thin walled cyst filled with mucinous contents. That brings us to our third slide scan. Let me find it. Here is the tumor. So this is the larger side. And it's not so impressive, right? For such a big tumor, it's not so impressive. It's mucinous. We see, we see uh, mucin dissecting the ovarian stroma and uh, we see that the lining cells are pretty bland, right? Very, very bland looking cells. I mean, you could, if you didn't have the growth, you could call this a mucinous stadnoma. But here you start having some pseudostratification, so it gets, it's starting to get more to a borderline tumor maybe. Uh, here we have some tufting, I mean, some piling up of the epithelium. So that's the appearance of the ovary. And this is the immunohistochemistry for the ovarian tumor. It's CK7 negative, CK20 diffusely and strongly positive, as well as CDX2 strongly and diffusely positive, SAFB2 strongly and, well, moderately and diffusely positive, and PAX8 was negative. This is just cytoplasmic staining. So looks familiar, right? Looks very familiar to the case we just discussed of a primary ovarian mucinous tumor arising in a teratoma. This immunohistochemical pattern is almost like practically identical, but this is the appendix. So even though we don't see grossly a tumor, it's definitely dilated and abnormal. So let's see how the appendix looks under the microscope. Here it is. So we have a dilated appendiceal wall, that shows a mucinous neoplasm, which is low-grade. So this is a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm here. 
that looks very similar to the ovary. However, what was very challenging about this case is that there was no invasion of the appendiceal wall, no even mucin dissecting through the appendiceal wall. But clearly, I mean, that should be the primary even though this was a tough case, definitely shared with GI and, and got their opinion on this case. So what's the most appropriate diagnosis? Well, I think this is an easy one. So let's go straight to the answer. This is a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm metastatic to the ovaries, primary appendiceal. Appendiceal primaries are the most single most common tumor to metastasize to the ovaries. But the problem is oftentimes it's lemon. It's not adenocarcinoma or goblet cell carcinoid. And lemon is deceptively bland. You can totally think it's a mucinous stadnoma or a primary mucinous borderline tumor. Uh, there are a few features that you see that are helpful. Uh, that can help you think about an appendiceal primary. One is extensive pseudomyxoma ovarii. Extensive uh, pseudomyxoma ovarii is usually not a feature of primary ovarian tumors. They can have some small focal areas, they can have mucin extraposition with histiocytes, but like this clean mucin dissection of the ovarian stroma, you more often see in you see it with metastasis from appendix and from primary ovarian tumors in teratomas and not your usual gastrointestinal type primary ovarian tumor. Subeptilial clefts are claimed to be characteristic. Honestly, I see that in primary ovarian tumors as well. So I'm not sure they're that characteristic. And then the epithelium is typically very tall um, and you have like very visible goblet cells and uniform basally located nuclei. There is one more, there are actually two more ovarian morphologies we should explore. This is one of them. So look at these cases. These are three different cases. So gross pathology of three different ovarian masses. This case A is a very large tumor with solid cystic. It's clearly necrotic. Ask yourself, is this benign or malignant? I would say that the gross impression is malignant. What about the other two cases? So those are like very bland looking um, thin walled ovarian cysts and they're, they're quite small. So what's your impression? If you got this at the frozen section bench, would you think this is primary, this is metastatic, uh, is this benign or malignant? This case here, microscopically, had a very similar appearance to very mucinous borderline tumors of gastrointestinal type. It had this very large cyst filled with mucin, and when we looked uh, closely, actually, they did not look that bad, right? Uh, they looked mucinous uh, and more like a borderline, maybe looking um, borderline like appearance. Case C, which was that thin walled cyst. It was so thin wall that we actually did a roll. I took a picture of the slide. So we couldn't find a single solid area to take a section. So we did a membrane roll like we do for placentas. And uh, here you can see the lining, very mucinous, kind of bland. But both of these tumors are metastases from pancrobiliary primaries, all three of them actually. So Pancreatic biliary metastasis to the ovary can be quite tricky. Sometimes they'll be obviously malignant as case A, but sometimes they will be so bland like case C. I didn't show pictures for case B, but microscopically it was as bland as case C. However, there are some hints that you can use to think about a primary pancreatic biliary tumor. They usually have a characteristic appearance, and that characteristic appearance is large cystic structures with deceptively bland cytologic features, and that's what we saw in these two cases already. But in addition to that, they show what we call maturation phenomenon. That's when we have small invasive single cells or small acini with marked atypia that are sitting next to the cystic structures. And that's pretty much always, almost always present in pancreatic biliary primaries. So this is what I'm talking about here. 
this was a big cystic structure like this one here. Imagine it was a big cystic structure. And then in the wall, you find this invasion, like here. This is the pancreatic primary for case A. Here's uh, some uh, endocrine components from the pancreas. The second case, I mean, third case, right, case C was also so bland, that membrane role, but within uh, the wall, we could see areas of infiltration in which nuclei look much more atypical. And for that case, we don't, didn't have the pancreas, but we have the core of the pancreas, which is shown here on the right. Now, if you do cytology, you'll know that actually the size of cells in this very focal marked atypia within the same group of cells is something using pancreatic FNAs. So it's, it's basically just translated, translated to the ovary what you see in the pancreas. Immunohistochemically, uh, these tumors can be a mixture of CK7, CK20 positive, some CDX2 positive. However, one thing that is characteristic is loss of SMAD4, GPC4, which is found in about 50% of cases. If you don't have a loss, it's not helpful. But if you have loss, like in this first case, case A, then that's a strong evidence for a pancreatic, pancreatobiliary primary. There is one more ovarian morphology I would like to touch upon, and that's uh, endocervical, which is actually number three in our list. This is a scary thing because it's uncommon, so we tend to not think about it. And it's scary because in many cases, the cervical primary is unknown before uh, the presentation of ovarian metastasis. It's also scary because it can be minimally invasive in the cervix and it still leads to ovarian metastasis. Plus, it can simulate primary ovarian tumors, not only histologically, as I'm going to show, but they're often bilateral and less than 10 centimeters. I didn't have a case to show you because, as I said, this is quite uncommon, but I got this from one of the main papers that have been published on the subject. And you can see that you totally could buy this for an ovarian mucinous tumor, primary in the ovary. The good thing is that they are mostly HPV associated, so they would be positive for P16 and HPV in situ. However, if you're talking about the HPV negative type of endocervical adenocarcinoma, then that's really trouble because then there is no biomarker you could use, right? So in those cases, you really will have to rely on the identification of the cervical primary. It would be extremely unusual for a mucinous carcinoma to metastasize to the cervix. So if you have a cervical, a cervical adenocarcinoma and ovarian adenocarcinoma, I could say that the cervix is the primary site. Thankfully, those are very rare. Now let's move on to the fourth of our four main features that help us differentiate primary versus metastasis, and that's a very important one, extravariant spread of syndromic somovarii. That brings us to our last case, for today. Case four is a 58-year-old female who presented to her primary care physician with anemia, fatigue, and abdominal pain. CT scan showed a 12 centimeter mass in the pelvis with multiple septations and nodular masses that were suggestive of a malignant ovarian neoplasm. So she already presented with her imaging saying this is an ovarian primary. And then on, on laparotomy, the impression of the surgeon listed in the op note was that this was uh, a stage 3C ovarian cancer with extensive peritoneal involvement. So let me show you a scan of the ovary. Here is the ovary. So if you are thinking about what we have discussed already, you will be pretty comfortable saying this is a carcinoma, right? It's too crowded. There, there are like no big cysts with mucin. This is just confluent glandular pattern. It's actually quite atypical, right? Uh, so this is a mucinous carcinoma. And actually, it's not super mucinous in this section, but there were some other ones that were mucinous, more mucinous than this. 
And you can see here that some of the areas were more like a single layer of cells that also looked atypical. So that's the right ovary. This is the original diagnosis. Okay, this is an old case, and this was way past called mucinous adenocarcinoma intestinal type. That was the diagnosis for the ovary. And there was a note saying that the differential included primary ovarian met versus metastasis from GGI tract. The problem with this case is that the ovary was assigned in the synoptic report as the primary. So you get imaging, you get operative impression, you get pathology report, everything together. This patient was just labeled as having a primary ovarian mucinous carcinoma. But months later, she kept progressing on chemotherapy. She kept having GI symptoms and abdominal pain. So um, additional studies were performed and showed a circumferential mass in the second portion of the duodenum. And this is the mass. Here we have the native epithelium, and here we have the tumor, which actually looks similar to the ovarian tumor. Bottom line is, this was always a duodenal primary. However, it was mistaken for an ovarian primary for almost a year before this patient had a proper diagnosis. But if you look back to the very to the resection, so if you go back to that operation in which the ovarian tumors were removed and staging was performed, this was the omentum. So the omentum at the time of primary diagnosis was packed with adenocarcinoma. So I can tell you this is inconsistent with an ovarian primary. So if you have extensive extravariant, I mean, not extensive, if you have extravariant spread, meaning adenocarcinoma, at the time of diagnosis, that's, I mean, many studies have shown that some metastasis. There are very rare exceptions. One exception are the ovarian mucinous tumors arising in teratoma in the ovary. I just would like to quickly go through mucinous cystadenoma because I think this, amazingly enough, this causes some problems, okay? So we all know how a mucinous cystadenoma looks like. I, I really don't need to go much through that. If you want to refer to it later, I have here some um, descriptions of how what is expected. The main differential is lemon, right? But SATB2 is positive in, in metastatic lemon and negative in mucinous cystadenoma, so that should be helpful. What I would like to emphasize is that if you have the appendix in your resection specimen and it's normal, or if you have a SATB2 negative, uh, well, if you have a normal appendix, what I mean is do not include metastasis in the differential diagnosis because this, the, the surgeons on, or the oncologists, they don't want to investigate these patients for every single primary site if this is just a benign mucinous cystadenoma in the ovary. The other differential is pancreatobiliary, but in this case, you should be able to tell because as we discussed, this is just not an uniform bland cytology. In both of these instances, I truly believe that if you have a bland mucinous cystadenoma in the ovary, you should be able to tell so in your report without including metastasis in the differential. But that's not true for intraoperative consultation. So on frozen section, even if it's a bland mucinous cystadenoma, potentially it could be metastatic from the appendix or pancreas. But once you have the entire picture, meaning once you have the appendix, once you have the immunostains, once you have multiple sections, then you should be able to tell them apart. And this is a little table I put together to help you differentiate uh, these three possibilities of very bland looking thin walled uh, ovarian mucinous tumors. The third challenge in ovarian mucinous tumors is to interpret immunohistochemistry. And uh, I can give you like an absolute recommendation. Uh, I have put in a few tables, like a couple of tables to help you. As you can see, there are a lot of pluses and minuses here. And unless 
except for the, the, the scenarios of immunohistochemical patterns that I have already shown you, it may not be that helpful. It's very helpful in a few cases. It's not super helpful in, an, in other cases. You really have to put everything into context with clinical growth. This is a little table I put together with um, per stain. So the first one was per tumor type. This is per stain. You may refer to it later. You may screen, make a screenshot and, and, and have it handy for your cases. This is another table. So I actually made three tables in an attempt to show you what to expect because there's so much variation. But overall, what, how I would think about it is that primary ovarian mucinous tumors are almost always immunoreactive for CK7, whereas metastatic colorectal carcinomas or appendiceal carcinomas are usually CK7, I mean, colorectal are usually CK7 positive, but CK7 can be also positive in appendix or pancreatic biliary. Um, but when you have expression of CK20 and CDX2 in a primary ovarian tumor, it tends to be like patchy and moderate in contrast with metastatic lower GI and appendix, which tends to be strong and diffuse. So this is my like ma major summary, is that most primary ovarian mucinous tumors are CK7 positive and SATB2 negative, SATB2 negative. So two red flags, an ovarian tumor that is CK7 negative or an ovarian tumor that is, shows strong positivity for SATB2. That's the scenario in which you should worry about metastasis. That's the main scenario where metastasis are a concern. Of course, if you have SMAD4, loss, uh, pancreatic biliary is favored, and you can use ER for malarian type. The fourth challenge for uh, ovarian mucinous tumors is how to report. And, and I see people struggling a lot of that. I mean, how do, you, how do you put in a report all of these variations that we can face with these tumors? So is it necessary to differentiate between intestinal type and malarian type in all ovarian tumors? I would say yes for adenocarcinoma, yes for borderline tumor, and not for adenoma. Why? Because if you call it a malarian type, you don't need to look for a metastatic source because that affects the prognosis. Here are some examples of re a report that I would recommend and a report that I would not recommend. So suppose you have a mucinous carcinoma in the ovary that is primary ovarian, but 85% of the tumor volume was borderline or benign looking. I don't think it's appropriate that you call the whole thing a mucinous adenocarcinoma. I think it's best if you actually say uh, the size of each component if possible. Another thing that is non-contributory to mucinous tumors of the ovary in general is differentiation. So you can say it's well, moderate or poorly differentiated, but truth is, if it's primary ovarian, it's usually going to be well to moderately differentiated, and that doesn't really impact treatment or prognosis. And another thing that I advise you to remember to always include is that if you're seeing an expansile type of invasion or an infiltrative destructive type of invasion, if you don't, and a gynecologic oncologist uh, examines the patient, treats the patient, they're they are gonna ask you for this information because in their literature, those two types of invasion dictate prognosis and even management. So what I recommend for reporting ovarian mucinous tumors, always address primary site. Even if it's a benign mucinous cyst adenoma, I usually say like mucinous cyst adenoma consistent with ovarian primary or primary ovarian mucinous cyst adenoma. That's definitely true for borderline tumors. If you are not addressing it in the headline diagnosis, at least write a comment saying what you favor and why. Um, I think it's important to include all components in your diagnosis, maybe not the adenoma, but if you have carcinoma and borderline tumor, I would include both. If you have a borderline tumor with some benign looking areas, you can just call the whole thing a mucinous borderline tumor. Specify always in your diagnosis if it's intestinal type or malarian type, and again, specify if it's expensive or infiltrated invasion if it's an invasive carcinoma. 
One important aspect that I illustrate with case four is if you're not sure the tumor is primary in the ovary, do not assign it as such in the synoptic report. Once you assign a tumor as primary site in the synoptic report, the, the patient is going to be labeled with that primary site. So be really careful with that. I think there are two options. One, you can omit the synoptic report and explain a comment that the primary is unknown and therefore a synoptic report cannot be provided. Or you can provide a synoptic report and state for the primary site that it cannot be determined with a comment. Challenge number five with intra is intraoperative consultation. I think that's very, very challenging for everyone, me included. I wish I could give you more information on this, but unfortunately, uh, time does not allow for that. And in this amazing lecture series for GYN, Carlos and I are working with uh, Rifat and Emilio in uh, scheduling there will be an intraoperative consultation teaching session. So that should cover this particular topic. I just will leave you with some examples of a uh, frozen section diagnosis that we use here, me and my colleagues. And I think that those are very well received by the surgeons and they find it helpful. So I do recommend it. The first one is a very bland looking tumor. So for those, we usually say, bland mucinous neoplasm in one or two sections examined, defer to permanence. If it looks like a borderline tumor to you on IOC, we usually say mucinous neoplasm, at least borderline if primary, metastasis cannot be excluded. Or if it looks clearly like a malignant mucinous carcinoma, we'll say that the differential includes ovarian metastasis. So do not stick your neck out too much on frozen sections for mucinous tumors. Be general. Keep in mind that on frozen section, even if it looks super bland, metastases are in the differential. This is a little table on prognosis. Uh, mucinous borderline tumor primary in the intestinal type versus carcinoma. Expensive intestinal type have very similar, uh, excellent prognosis. Malarian uh, primary mucinous tumors also have ex excellent prognosis while the intestinal type primary ovarian with infiltrative pattern is supposed to have a very poor prognosis. As I said, this is very rare. And most papers that have been published on this subtype were pre-IHC era. So I honestly don't know how reliable this information is. But theoretically, and that's what clinicians base their treatment on, is that if it's infiltrative, it's bad, they have to be aggressive with treatment. So now, take home messages, we're almost done. When is it safe to assign an ovarian mucinous tumor as primary ovarian? It is safe when it's a millarian type, when it's associated with a teratoma, when it's associated with Brenner tumor, and if it's an uniformly bland mucinous cystadenoma on permanent sections uh, and the tumor is well sampled. When can you favor an ovarian mucinous primary uh, even though you cannot be 100% sure. Uh, I would favor it when you have a large and unilateral mucinous borderline tumor gastrointestinal type, no previous history, of course, negative appendix, no extra variant spread. The histology is compatible with, I, with uh, what I have shown you for this tumor type, and you have supportive immunohistochemistry. When is an ovarian mucinous tumor metastatic? For sure, when you have known extra variant primary sites, almost for sure is when you have metastatic morphologies and very likely if you have bilateral ovarian involvement. When is it reasonable to suggest that a primary site cannot be determined? So, First of all, you shouldn't do that in every case. I think this lecture is really to help you to try to make a decision in most cases. If you really cannot tell, uh, I think that these are the situations in which you can be worried that it's either a primary or metastatic. It looks mucinous gastrointestinal type, but it's small. 
it has some worrisome histologic features for metastasis, like that maturation pattern in pancreatic, like pseudomyxoma varii, or you have equivocal immunohistochemistry or immunohistochemistry that is worrisome for metastasis, like a pure enteric type, but you don't have really a primary to point to. So basically, in conclusion, in the majority of cases, the distinction between primary and metastatic mucinous carcinoma of the ovary can be made. You have to integrate clinical features, growth findings, histopathologic features, and immunohistochemistry in order to achieve that. And hopefully, this session has helped you understanding what all those features are. We have a big list of references because a lot of nice papers have been published in this subject. Oh, sorry, I'm missing one through 14. <laughs> I will make sure I send it to Rifat and Emilio to make it available. And uh, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Um, I just created a brand new Twitter account upon recommendations of Pathcast organizers so I can make myself available for questions. I'll also be on Facebook and be able to answer questions that you might have about the subject. I live in Los Angeles. We have great sunsets in the Pacific Ocean here. Uh, this is a great picture uh, of a sunset uh, near uh, Santa Monica Pier. And, and that ends my session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Medeiros, for your uh, wonderful presentation. I have a few questions that I can see online, so I can pass them on to you. Uh, the first question is from Adelina, who wants to know, can other primary ovarian mucinous tumors, except those associated with teratoma, be said to be too positive? Very rarely, about 5% of cases. Yes, that has been reported. No immunohistochemical stain is 100%. Uh, we actually have had some cases like that here, including a very bland looking tumor. What we usually do, we'll say that a primary, if everything else looks primary ovarian, but you only have set B2 positivity, we usually write a comment saying that based on this and that, it seems like it's a primary ovarian. However, set B2 positivity is concerning for a metastatic or like a metastatic gastrointestinal appendicitis or primary. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Khadiza. The primary duodenal adenocarcinoma is very uncommon. The case you have discussed is a very unique one in my consideration. How often do you find duodenal primary? It's very rare. In all our files here at Cedars, I've looked up for many years back for this lecture. That was the only one. And I didn't have time to share this with you in the lecture, but actually immunohistochemistry for that case, both in the primary and the metastatic tumor was that B2 positive. But it's very, very rare. And I think that's one of the reasons why that case was initially mistaken as an ovarian primary. Our next question is from Pyle Janice Patel, who wants to know, is there a useful immunomarker to distinguish primary and meta primary mucinous adenocarcinoma from metastatic colorectal carcinoma? Yes, I, I like CETP2 is supposed to be the best one. Uh, in the past, we used to use CK20 and CDX2 a lot, but a lot of primary ovarian mucinous tumors, gastrointestinal type, show considerable positivity for CK20 and CDX2, but CEP2 is a really good marker. Only about 5% of primary ovarian tumors will be positive for CEP2. So if you have strong and diffuse CEP2 positivity, particularly if associated with CK7 negative tumor, then I would say that's a really good colorectal marker. Uh, some studies also show beta catenin. If you have nuclear beta catenin, that's a really good indication as well for a colorectal primary, and that's something you can use in some questionable cases. Our next question is from BP, uh, who wants to know, is it possible to differentiate metastatic and primary without an immuno? Because in her setup, immuno is not routinely done. Yes, that's definitely possible. And we do not order immuno in all of our cases. So 
cases in which you can feel comfortable uh, in calling a primary ovarian without immuno, that bland mucinous adenoma with no atypia, no proliferation, no red flags, that you can call a mucinous adenoma of the ovary without immunos. Moving on to borderline tumors, if it has the features of a Millerian type mucinous borderline tumor with those broad edematous papillae, like really endocervical looking lining with other cell types like hobnail cells, squamous cells, clear cells, that tumor you do immuno if you can, but if you cannot, I think it's totally diagnosable on, on a &E. Another situation, if you work in a setting where you have limited resources, a very typical mucinous borderline tumor primary in the ovary, like the ones I showed you, if you have like, if, they, if you have a very large, you, large, like 20, 30 centimeters unilateral, ovarian mucinous tumor that grossly is multiloculated and entirely cystic, thin-walled with no solid areas. And you look at the micro and all you have are those huge cysts, right? Very big cysts with filiform papillae. Honestly, I, that's highly unlikely to be metastatic. I, that's a very characteristic primary ovarian mucinous borderline tumor. And I think you, you could do it without immunos, even because usually the immunos are going to show a gastrointestinal type. And just by seeing goblet cells, you know it's intestinal type. So sometimes immunos are not helpful because if it's on age and it's intestinal type, the immuno is going to be intestinal type. So that's another situation. If you have a teratoma, you don't need immunos. If you have a Brenner tumor, you don't need immunos. Um, I think the hardest area are carcinomas. If you're really dealing with a carcinoma, then it's probably best to have uh, immunostains, uh, but not necessarily. I hope this long answer answers the question. <laughs> so the next question uh, I see from a good friend of mine, Angela, she's in UK. So, so the question is, uh, she finds metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma usually have thick viscid mucin that one can slice through even in the first state. Send for intraoperative consult. Is that your experience? That's that's what she wants to know. Yes, I agree. I, I do think that uh, in metastatic tumors, not all of them, but particularly as I showed that appendiceal primary, the mucin is very thick and you can almost cut through it. And actually that uh, appendiceal mucinous primary, we saw that. That is my experience. Uh, and actually that brings a good point. Sometimes mucinous cystadenomas of the ovary actually have even serous fluid. They don't even have mucinous fluid. Uh, I think if you have, uh, as your friend has mentioned, this very thick mucin that you can almost cut through, you should worry about metastasis. Uh, that is my experience and I completely agree. Thank you. And there's another question. Um, Gayatri wants to know, do you have any morphological pattern to identify metastasis from gallbladder? Well, gallbladder would be pancreatobiliary, right? So. Um, Usually, I, I must say I haven't seen many, but being pancreatobiliary, more, I, I would expect it to not be so bland. So let me put it this way, it's rare, right? I, I don't think I have like a, an absolute um, recommendation, but I would expect those to actually look like adenocarcinomas in the ovary that have a, a metastatic pattern rather than simulating an ovarian primary. I think I think they probably should look metastatic somehow due to infiltration and greater atypia, and they're not going to simulate as well a mucinous borderline tumor, for example, primary in the ovary. But uh, that's a hard one. I think uh, we don't have a lot of experience with that. Thank you. The next question is from here. The question is, uh, first of all, uh, he wants to compliment you for the great presentation and also wants to know what are the core concepts and criteria to classify ovarian mucinous tumor? Can you repeat the first part of the question, which concepts? Uh, what are the core concepts and criteria to classify ovarian mucinous tumors? Cool. 
I'm main sorry. concept, I mean, the core concept, like yeah, main. Oh, concept. the core. So yeah. those would be the the first four high, the first the first four bolds in in that list that I provided. So if it's a millerian, I I think I I hope I understand the question, but I would say bilaterality, size, uh, extra variant spread, millerian subtype. Uh, metastatic morphology. So I, I, I wouldn't say like there is one, and I, I think that's a message I would like to convey with this session is that there is not a single criterion you can use. You always have to put everything into context and use multiple um, multiple features as I explained. So I, I don't think there is a core. There are a few features that were addressed here, but there isn't an absolute feature. Right. Uh, next one is from John. The question is, how frequent are metastases from cervical adenocarcinoma to the ovary and the other way around? They are uncommon. In that list that I showed, it was about 13%, and I think that's an overestimate. Uh, by the way, there aren't a lot of single institutional studies in ovarian mucinous tumors. A lot of these studies are from consultation files, and those tend to be biased towards difficult cases, challenging cases. There are very few studies in which the entire cohort of a single institution was looked at. One of those studies is the one that quotes endocervical as being 13%. I think that's way too high. That's very uncommon. I have seen it like in 20 years, I have seen it a couple of times. So it is very uncommon, but at the same time, it has been proven that the cervical primary may be unknown and may be actually a very small invasive uh, cervical primary. So I think that even though it's, I would consider it even, I probably not rare, but a very uncommon, you should think about it. Particularly if you the uterus was removed, um, and the immunohistochemical pattern is kind of not consistent with what you would expect. Uh, I think you should keep it always in the back of your mind that a cervical primary is possible. Right. Uh, the next question is from Sally. I don't think I got the name right. Uh, who wants to know, do you ever use the Shimizu slash Silverberg system for grading ovarian tumors, Mullerian type? Uh, I do not. Um, we usually just call them, as I said, the great majority of them are borderline tumors and we do not grade them. And most authors even believe that carcinomas do not exist. Uh, I'm not familiar with this grading scheme. We do not use it. Um, I will certainly take a look. <laughs> Thanks for bringing this up. All right. Uh... The next question is from Tuyet in Canada, uh, who wants to know how do you measure the invasion areas in the background of borderline tumor? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I didn't go into much detail uh, because of time in the lecture, but when I say a size estimation is when you can give a size estimation, right? So in the example that I showed, you had a clear cut invasive area versus a clear cut borderline area. If that happens, you can measure and provide a measure, but oftentimes they just blend into each other and you cannot give a measure. That's why I said measure slash, slash estimation. If everything is kind of mixed up, what we do and what I recommend is you will say like uh, mucinous carcinoma, coma expansile invasion, multiple microscopic foci arise in the background of mucinous borderline tumor intestinal type. So if you cannot give a size, that's totally fine, but just say like it is multiple microscopic foci or scattered microscopic foci and give the background of mucinous borderline tumor. You don't need to give it a size, just give it a size if it's actually possible. Talking about size, uh, there's another size related question from Sophie, so who says that uh, she has doubts about the size of mucinous tumor. And in their experience, the patient uh, usually comes at an advanced stage. Could the advance in time and the large size still be considered as an ovarian primary? Uh, could you please repeat? <laughs> Sorry. 
So no, the question is that uh, sometimes the patient comes at an advanced stage, uh -huh. and could the advance in time and the large size still be considered as just primary? I, I didn't. Uh, okay. I see. Okay, my understanding from this question is if the patient presents with advanced stage disease, could be the large ovarian size just be a reflection of advanced stage disease? So mucinous tumors primary in the ovary are like 95% are stage one at diagnosis. So if you have an advanced stage tumor, if that's what it was meant, right? Stage as far as FIGO stage, you think you should think is a primary. But maybe the question could be worded in another way. Do you mean like time-wise? Does it mean like the tumor has been sitting there for a long time? Well, I'm not sure. A lot of these patients present with pre-acute or subacute symptoms. So I think the mucin accumulating the tumor grows very fast. As far as size, just to reemphasize, if it's a very large mucinous tumor, more often it will be primary, but it can be metastatic. So it is true that a large size does not prove its primary ovarian. However, if you have a small mucinous tumor in the ovary, you should think metastasis because it's quite uncommon for primary ovarian mucinous tumor to be small. I hope this answers the question. I'm sorry, I may not have understood it correctly. I think you got it right. Uh, you know, one last question from Raquel. The question is, have you ever seen an ovarian mucinous tumor in an endometrioma? Oh, yes. So if that's actually a very good question, and it's actually a very helpful setting. So if you have a patient with either history of endometriosis or endometriosis in peritoneal biopsies, or you get an endometrioma, and you see an ovarian mucinous tumor in the endometrioma, I can guarantee you 99% it's Millerian type because endometriosis is a precursor of those tumors, a very characteristic association. And I didn't have time to show a very cool case we had recently, which was basically an endometrioma with lots of mucinous metaplasia and some small foci of mucinous borderline to malaria type. So bottom line is you have an endometrioma, you can be pretty sure the mucinous tumor that is arising in association with that endometrioma is of Millerian type, and therefore you don't need to worry about metastasis. And that actually also answers the questions about when you don't need immunostains. If you have an endometrioma in the background, it's probably like very likely Millerian, and you don't really need immunohistochemistry to prove it. I think that's all for questions uh, that we have now. And uh, as uh, Dr. Madeira has mentioned, if you have questions, you can reach her on Twitter and maybe you can uh, drop your questions on Facebook also. She would be happy to answer them. And... Those are really great questions. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate uh, that you have so many questions. That means that the message was passed through and I, I really appreciate you having such great questions. And yes, as Rifa said, I will be available on Twitter and Facebook to answer any additional questions you might have. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Medeiros for uh, such an excellent uh, discussion on ovarian mucinous tumors. And as you can see that uh, the viewers definitely loved it. And you would be so glad to hear that uh, you had several hundred viewers from across the world. And actually I could count at least uh, viewers from 35 different countries wow, who joined the lecture, crazy. including viewers from your native Brazil. There were viewers of course from USA and India, Japan, Algeria, Portugal, uh, Bosnia, um, Ukraine, Peru, to name a few. And thank you all of our viewers for watching the lectures and for your support. And as always, please feel free to uh, follow our Facebook page that is Patcast. And also please subscribe to our YouTube channel that's also Patcast. And in fact, if you check the bell button, then you want to subscribe, then you will be updated about the upcoming lectures. And in fact, tomorrow we have our next lecture on GYU and PAT series. So that is from Dr. Carlos Paraheran, who is from University of Toronto in Canada. And he's going to discuss about benign and premalignant endometrial pathology for everyday practice. And that would be tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So hope to see you all there. Thank you again. And thank you, Dr. Medeiros, once again. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be part of this global pathology community. Very exciting. Thank you.